Thank you for joining us today. We are in our 17th year of first person, and our first person today is Mrs. Irene Weiss, whom we shall meet shortly. This 2016 season of first person is made possible by the generosity of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation with additional funding from the Arlene and Daniel Fisher Foundation. We are grateful for their sponsorship. First Person is a series of conversations with survivors of the Holocaust who share with us their first-hand accounts of their experience during the Holocaust. Each of our First Person guests serves as volunteers here at this museum. Our program will continue twice weekly through mid-August. The museum's website, the address is listed at the back of your program, provides information about each of our upcoming First Person guests. The web address is www.ushmm.org. Anyone interested in keeping in touch with the museum and its programs can complete the Stay Connected card that you'll find in your program or speak with a museum representative at the back of the theater. In doing so, you will receive an electronic copy of Irene Weiss's biography so that you can remember and share her testimony after you leave here today. Irene will share with us her first person account of her experience during the Holocaust and as a survivor for about 45 minutes. If we have time toward the end of our program, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask Irene some questions. The life stories of Holocaust survivors transcend the decades. What you are about to hear from Irene is one individual's account of the Holocaust. We have prepared a brief slide presentation to help with her introduction. Irene Weiss was born Irene Fogel in Botraj, Czechoslovakia on November 21, 1930. The arrow on this map of Czechoslovakia indicates the general location of Botraj. Irene's father, Meyer, owned a lumber yard, and her mother, Leah, cared for Irene and her siblings. In this photograph, Irene is at the lower left with two of her sisters and two cousins. When Nazi Germany took over and divided Czechoslovakia in 1939, Botraj fell under Hungarian rule. Irene and her siblings could not attend school, and her father, along with thousands of other Jewish men, was conscripted into forced labor for six months in 1942. In April 1944, the Fogels were moved into the Munkaj ghetto, where they lived in a brick factory. The arrow on this map points to Munkaj. In May 1944, Irene and her family were deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau. The arrow on this map of major Nazi camps points to Auschwitz. This photo was taken upon Irene's arrival at Auschwitz. The circle, circled figure in your lower left is Irene. Irene and her sister, Serena, were selected for forced labor, then were forcibly evacuated in, 19, in January of 1945 to other camps in Germany. This extraordinary photo is displayed in the museum's permanent exhibition. The liberation by the Soviet army of the Neustadt Gleva camp, where Irene and Serena worked near the end of the war, left the girls unguarded, and they were able to make their way to Prague to look for their relatives. Of their immediate family, only Irene and Serena survived the war. In 1947, the girls and their Aunt Rose who had been with them throughout their time in the camps were able to immigrate to New York. This, showed, this photograph shows Irene and Serena upon their arrival in the United States. After arriving in the United States and living in New York, Irene met and married Marty Weiss in 1949. They moved to Virginia in 1953, where Irene lives today. Irene earned a degree in education from American University and taught English as a second language in the Fairfax County, Virginia public school system. She taught middle school students from many countries. Irene's husband, Marty, passed away in January 2013. Marty, who was 93, was a combat veteran of the Second World War, seeing action in North Africa, Italy, and elsewhere in Europe. He had a long and distinguished career as a geologist with the federal government. Irene and Marty were married 63 years. Irene and Marty have three children, four grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. Irene's daughter, Leslie, is here today in the front row and right next to Irene. Irene became a volunteer for this museum five years ago, and this is her fifth time speaking as part of the First Person Program. In January 2015, Irene was a member of the U.S. delegation to the 70th anniversary commemoration of the liberation of Auschwitz. 
In July 2015, Irene traveled to Germany with her daughter Leslie to be present at the trial of former SS member Oskar Groning, who was a guard at Auschwitz. Irene was a co-plaintiff in the trial of Groning, and again in February of this year at the trial of SS member Reinhold Hanning. Her testimony at Hanning's trial was featured in the most recent issue of Time magazine. And with that, I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming our first person, Mrs. Irene Weiss. Thank you, Irene. Irene, thank you so much for being willing to be our first person and spend this hour with us. You, you have, we, we could keep you here all afternoon, but we'll, we'll let you go at the end of the, the next hour, so we'll start. Irene, you described for me the time for you and your family in Czechoslovakia before World War II, before the Holocaust, as a time of hard work, but also a good life, one in which there was, in your words, a sense of safety. Before we turn to the war years, tell us about your family and your life in those years before the war in Czechoslovakia. Yes, well, I, I lived in a small town, a farming town, population only 1,000. Everybody knew everybody else. My family were friends with the neighbors. I had a lot of uh, girlfriends in school, not Jewish girlfriends. We ming mingled, we got along well. We uh, visited each other. As you say, it was a, a peaceful time. Mm -hmm. uh, my father and, and mother spent their time working, working hard, raising children. Um, we, we, children went to school. Uh, there was a lot of uh, religious observance mm -hmm. in our family. And, you know, looking forward to the usual seasons and, and mm -hmm. good times that mm -hmm. children have. Mm -hmm. So basically it was a normal childhood. Tell us a little about your siblings. There were six children mm -hmm. in our family, ranging from seven to 17. And uh, it was a very hard work for my parents to raise mm -hmm. the children. There were, in those days, children didn't have the medical care and parents were very worried about the slightest fever because it, you know, there was no penicillin and things mm -hmm. that helps today. Mm -hmm. So th there was, uh, my, my mother was the kind who uh, worried a lot and hovered over us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. we were very much loved and our, our father was uh, a gentle and kind, uh, hands-on father. How, how large was your extended family? Gr my grandparents lived in the, the near, uh, nearby town just a few kilometers away. Um, my, uh, that was my mother's parents. They had several adult, uh, young adult uh, children, our aunts and uncles. Visiting them was uh, the greatest pleasure that we could spend the night or a weekend there. And um, there, was, there was a lot of family events and a lot of good times mm -hmm. for the children. I think you described your grandfather's place as a, as a magical place for you as kids. Yes, he had a summer place mm -hmm. in a mountainous area and the grandchildren mm -hmm. would uh, be invited to spend the summer vacations mm -hmm. there. And the, the whole terrain there was different mountains and brooks mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and uh, different kinds of fruits in the in berries that we picked and so on. It was just a normal, happy childhood, mm -hmm. and we were mm -hmm. very, very much loved. We felt that at all times. You're, you're going to tell us later a little bit about more about your aunts, Rose and Pearl. Tell us about them at that time. They were, yeah. they were in part of your life as a child. Very much so. Mm -hmm. They were two young women when we were finally deported to Auschwitz. They were in their mid-20s. Mm -hmm. We did not arrive there together, but we met them there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took over being substitute right. parents to me and my sister. But visiting them was, you know, we, we addressed them in the kind of a adult way, like Aunt Rose and Aunt mm -hmm. Pearl, and, and never just, uh, you know, it was a, they, were, they were very important to us 
as, as the grown-ups that mm -hmm. we could emulate. Mm -hmm. and, by the time Germany invaded Poland in September 1939, of course, launching World War II, by that time, your community had already experienced profound change. Hungary was an ally of Nazi Germany, and earlier in 1939, before in the invasion of Poland, your community had been invaded or occupied by the Germans, uh, by the Hungarians, excuse me, yes. which immediately changed your lives. What happened once you were under Hungarian rule? Yes, well, we were under uh, Czechoslovak rule, and they were more accepting to different mm -hmm. kinds of people in their mm -hmm. community. When Hungary invaded our area, uh, they, their anti-Semitism came to the fore. Mm -hmm. They made many rules and laws to isolate their Jewish population, and so we were found we, we were subjected to all kinds of restrictions, how the, the law did not protect us anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were, uh, Jewish children could not attend Hungarian schools. Uh, the discrimination escalated as more and more the government gave the population permission to um, discriminate. And when it comes from the top, the people quickly pick it up. And so right. there were um, such things as, as invasion of, of our homes by so-called hoodlums. What they were, all they had to do is put on a swastika band and they seemed to be deputized to be in charge of, of uh, uh, the law. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we were already afraid and we were already um, worried about our safety. You told me about a, a, a very frightening incident with your father on a train. Will you tell us about that? Yes, yes. It, it was a very frightening experience. I was on uh, the train with my father going home from my grandparents' town, just about a five-minute train ride, really. And uh, he was he was recognized as, as probably a Jewish person because uh, he had a, a small beard, the kind that is very com popular and common right now, but at that time, religious Jewish men were probably the only ones mm -hmm. who had beards. And so these young men in the train decided that um, they would have some fun. Mm -hmm. And they surrounded him and me and began to make jokes about what shall we do with him and uh, wouldn't it be fun to throw him off the train and they had a big laugh over it and they approached closer and closer. In the meantime, the rest of the passengers didn't say anything or make a move towards protecting him and because I was with him, but I was just the observer and absolutely terrified. Right. And looking out the window to see how close we are to home when the train will stop. Mm -hmm. And actually that's what saved my father because the train um, stopped and we quickly got off. But um, it was uh, the, the first very terrifying experience where you felt the, the uh, uh, kind of a fun that young people would have with an older person just mm -hmm. because he was Jewish. Or and they could get away with it. So they could get away with it and no one rose to say anything. Right. And of course I, as, as the child of, you know, this was my father, I was absolutely terrified. Right. My father never rode the train again after that. Also during that time, he lost his business, didn't he? Yes, very soon after that, Jewish businesses were confiscated and given to non-Jews. And so, yes, his lumber yard, which uh, he had for years uh, and uh, uh, made a small living, mm -hmm. not fantastic. Mm -hmm. M mainly he sold lumber and construction material to farmers. Mm -hmm. it, it was confiscated and uh, not paid for. And so he now sat at home um, doing nothing much, you know, mm -hmm. helping with the house, the chores in the house. But his income stopped and there were six children to take care of. How did you manage to eat? Well, 
it, it was very scary. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother uh, grew a, a, a garden, a, a rather large garden, became part of her daily job to make sure that uh, there was food growing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, buying food from the farmers or exchanging things for food. But this could not have lasted very long because six children need a lot of taking care of in that right. regard. Right. In, in moving forward a little bit, in 1942, your father, along with thousands of other Jewish men, were forced by the Hungarians to do forced labor for the military. Tell us about your father's conscription into a forced conscription yeah. into a labor brigade and, well, and what yes. that meant to your family. Well, it, it was very frightening to find, we heard about young men being called in to a labor brigade. There was a war on and of course the Jews were not, uh, they were not uh, soldiers, they mm -hmm. were not given guns. They were just really used for uh, frontline, dangerous uh, mine clearing and, and heavy work. And they were heavily abused mm -hmm. because they were not treated as soldiers. It was really slave labor. And a lot of them were in injured. Mm -hmm. A lot of them never came back. Right. And it was a terribly scary thing for the head of the family to be taken away and then forced to do the kind of work he, he wasn't trained for mm -hmm. and, and the disrespect and the danger right. that went with it. So we were very frightened. And, and just to repeat something you said, they were forced to do things like walk into fields to clear for mines yes. ahead of the, yes. the, the, the soldiers. Right, so right. And so they were in, in great mm -hmm. danger. And by the end of the war, it was quite clear that a, a lo the largest percentage of them never came back. They were mm -hmm. killed. It so happened that at that particular time, they si still had some regard for uh, men who were, my father was 40 something and had six children. So after a while, he, six months or so, he was sent back. But the younger men were kept till the end of the war if they survived. You were nearly 12 at that time. Do you remember your father leaving for the forced labor and coming oh, back yes, home? What yes. that was like for you when he came home? Well, yes, uh, you know, it was, uh, our family was already in, in, in big trouble mm -hmm. because our father not only lost his business and couldn't provide, but now he physically was removed from us without any, uh, you know, kind of, um, knowledge that he'll be taken care of or that he will come back. So mm -hmm. uh, my mother was distraught and it was a, a, a terrible time for us. Mm -hmm. When he came back, his beard had been shaved and we the children barely recognized him because that's the only way we knew him. You know, he mm -hmm. was very subdued, very quiet. He did not tell us about what happened to him, mm -hmm. but it was obvious that he had a, a very a terrible experience, but mm. we were so grateful that he came home. That he came home. Yes. And, and you would continue, of course, under those circumstances in, until um, early in 1944. As difficult as life was for Jews under the Hungarian, Hungarian rule, it turned dramatically and tragically worse in 1944 when the Germans invaded Hungary. Tell us about that time yeah. um, and what it meant for the Germans to move into Hungary and why they did that in March 1944. Yes, yeah. yeah, so in, in Hungary was allied with Germany, but by 1944, the Germans were losing the war and the Hungarian government realized that they might be on the losing end of this war. Mm -hmm. And so they attempted to pull out of the alliance, uh, but Germany would have none of it. And so they actually invaded a former ally and we became under German uh, Nazi mm -hmm. rule and that changed everything because mm -hmm. although our life was difficult under the Hungarians, we lost our civil rights and, and, and freedoms and uh, you know opportunity to make a living and go to school and all that, but we were in our homes and we mm -hmm. were still a unit, a family, and it never occurred to us that we could be um, evicted from our home and from our uh, country. Mm -hmm. My father and his father were citizens of Hungary and we were comfortable with the idea that we will not 
were, were not going to be deported. However, as soon as the German army arrived in the general area and in our, in our town, um, they instigated, instituted the uh, Nuremberg Laws, mm -hmm. where Jews lost all their rights mm -hmm. and all their protection. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but within something like three weeks after the Germans occupied our area, uh, they began to, to uh, deport people. They, mm. they began to uh, collect Jews into ghettos in preparation to move them out of the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to you, us. You were, you were about 14. Do you remember the Germans actually coming in? I think you told me a little bit about that, that the Hungarians were celebrating the arrival of the Germans. Uh, yes, I remember very clearly when uh, the main road going through the town, the uh, local population lined the street with jugs of wine, mm. waiting for them while they were still out of sight. And then when you heard the marching of the boots and coming, they was cheering and celebration. And they rang the church bell. Rang the church bell. Yes. And actually, a, a huge army marched through the town, and they were given wine and food. And, and, and then they, they marched through and to the next town. But the, the flavor of what's to come remained with us All because right. we realized that the people welcomed them. And uh, it, 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 it was always more fear and terror and lack of protection. Mm -hmm. which if for a family with children, if the law abandons you and you're thrown at the mercy of these people who now obviously don't want you, you it, it's, it's really a, a terrifying thing. And I'm sure for most of us in this room, me included, that's, that's unimaginable, that kind of fear. It is unimaginable. Yeah. I, I agree that if, 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 you, if the law protects you, you're uh, lucky. Right. And as you were beginning to tell us, they began rounding up the Jews. And within just a few weeks, you yes. were forced into a ghetto. Yes. Within three weeks, we were announcement was made in our town that uh, we should gather at the uh, kind of a city hall area and bring just one suitcase each and leave our home. And uh, we, my parents, uh, my mother began to bake food and bread and things that uh, she could take for uh, feeding the children no matter where they will end up, where we will end up. And nobody ever told us where we're going or whether we're coming back mm -hmm. or what will happen to us. And so we all gathered in this uh, town hall area with, and then the other fa Jewish families in the town also arrived there and now all of them were in this one place and uh, we were on the floor of this town hall place and they were called in the men to a, an office to where the uh, local gendarmerie and uh, local officials were in one of the office rooms and they demanded from my father that he hand over his money and valuables and they were threatening him and they told him that they know he must have more than he gave them and uh, uh, he came back saying that he, he, he was rough, roughed up and roughly mm -hmm. treated. So very soon after that, some uh, tr a local transportation arrived. We were put into these wagons and uh, all the children and all the, the elderly, everybody, and mm -hmm. driven to the nearest big town where they, they set up a huge ghetto not just for our town, but for the towns, people, the Jews from all over the villages and towns. There were something like 12,000 people in this one place. It, it was a brick factory with huge uh, grounds and some uh, kind of uh, buildings mm -hmm. for the processing and building, uh, making of the, of the bricks. So 12,000 Jews from the surrounding from villages the surrounding all brought, put into this one into place. Into this one place mm -hmm. without any facilities. And, and, and no f facilities for hygiene, for everybody was in, on the floor of these barracks. Mm -hmm. uh, 
sick people, old people, pregnant women, newborns, everybody right. huddled together on the floor without any kind of facility. No water, no toilet facilities, no food facilities. And so we began to see that things will be um, too hard to bear. Mm -hmm. And yet, and yet at every step of the way, we still look to see what was still okay, what mm -hmm. we can still bear. And one of the things that was still okay, that the family was together. And that perhaps this is temporary and it can't be anything but temporary. So there was, was there hope that you might return back to your homes that you had left behind? Yes, we right. felt it was some kind of a, an aberration mm -hmm. that somebody will come to their senses and what do you do with 10 or a thousand or more people here with all the, all the needs? Uh, and, and we're still close to home mm -hmm. and we're still together. While you were in the Munkaj ghetto in the brick factory, I, I believe you told me your head was shaved at that point? Yes, well, the, life was very difficult. Right. Uh, and life was just uh, on, the, on the verge of being impossible. People were sick and children were uh, unhappy and, and so on. But, and then also hygiene was so terrible right. that right. originally uh, the order that uh, girls under 16 should have their uh, hair cut seemed to be a um, hygiene thing. Mm -hmm. And although drastic, uh, I ran and, and to the place and, and sat down and had, had my braids cut and I didn't even ask my mother for permission or tell her I was doing it. Mm -hmm. Because the thing, every announcement, every order was followed by you will be punished or your father will be beaten. That was their favorite way. And they often called in the men for questioning and beating mm -hmm. and, and having the kind of, of, kind of fun that they thought was uh, appropriate mm -hmm. to humiliate men in mm -hmm. particular. So I was terrified that my father would suffer as a result. So my, my poor mother, she gave me a kerchief to put on and I even, I was 13 years old at the time, I somehow understood that this isn't the worst thing, it's bad, but hair will grow out. You know, always you, you don't uh, totally give in to despair, mm -hmm. uh, uh, hoping, hoping. It turned out, I had no idea, never imagined that that thing that I arrived in Auschwitz soon after with a kerchief on my head and no hair made me look older and made me look like some of the married women who also covered their heads mm -hmm. after they married, the religious women. And so because of that, my age wasn't, thir wasn't evident that I was 13. And when the family was torn apart at the arrival in Auschwitz, separated, I was deemed to be old enough for slave labor, and I had mm -hmm. the first chance to survive the selection of um, who should live and who should die. Irene, tell us ab about the going to Auschwitz. You were in the Munkaj ghetto for about three weeks, yes. and then all of you were deported to Auschwitz by train, not, I, not knowing where you were going. Right. What, tell us about that. Well. It, it, we, after about three weeks, their announcements always ruled, you know, orders barked and announced, and the announcement was that a train was on, on the premises. There was a railroad siding at the factory there, and we didn't know that a train could arrive there right inside to take us to the next place. So this uh, long uh, train with cattle cars, a freight train, mm -hmm. arrived, and announcements were barked all over with loudspeakers that get your belongings and, and get into the train and with great haste and you know a lot of uh, harsh orders. So my parents grabbed the kids <laughs> and the belongings and we headed for the train and we 
were pushed in there with, you know, like 60 to 80 people into a cattle car again on, on sitting on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, the men would go to one side for modesty's sake and the women on the other side. And, and these were very small cattle cars. Very small. Yeah. It was packed, totally packed mm -hmm. this time. And then they put a bucket in, in the middle to, for the toilet. And again, nobody tells you where you're going. Nobody tells you uh, what's going to happen to you. And of course, at every ste a step, there are no facilities for ordinary needs. And mm -hmm. again, there are lots of children and lots of old people and lots of mm -hmm. people with immediate needs. And it's totally ignored. So here we're losing a little more hope as to what's happening to us because we are actually now being taken out of our surroundings. Right. Going to some unknown, unknown place. Unknown place with the unknown fate. The train stopped at Auschwitz. We saw that photograph, which is an extraordinary photograph, which shows you after you've gotten off of the, out of the boxcar. Don't take a little time just to tell us about that photograph, how you even have that. Well, I, when we arrived in Auschwitz, the doors opened from the outside and the shouting, yelling, get out, get out, everybody get out and leave everything behind. Mm -hmm. So now we have nothing, we jumped out uh, on the platform and lots of shouting. Again, men go to one side and women and children to the other. And my father and 16 year old brother lined up with a bunch of other men to one side. It shows that in that picture, how they're separated in one line. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we n I never saw them again, my father and 16-year-old brother. Uh, after so what we see in that photograph, that was the moment of the last time you saw your... Yes, your you see that column yeah. of men. They were standing there. After that, they were shouting that, you know, line up and go up the, the ramp. The crowd moved up, mm -hmm. up the ramp. We didn't see where we're going or... Uh, you know who was at the at the at the front of the ramp, but soon it became obvious that uh, we were up in front, and we were met with about a dozen Nazi soldiers blocking our way, and they were sort of somewhere standing right in the middle, and others to the side, holding the crowd to you know to stay in line, and in a matter of seconds, um, the family was torn apart. First, my mother and two little brothers were sent in one direction. Then immediately, my 17-year-old sister, Serena, into another direction. And that seemed to be where other young adults were sent. Mm -hmm. And so I and my younger sister, who was about 12 and I was 13, I was holding her hand. And this guy doing the separation had a stick in his hand. The stick came down between us. And between he, your hands? Between our hands as we, I was holding her. And he made me go towards the young adults and her to go where my mother and children went. I had no idea that photographs being taken, absolutely no idea at all, mm -hmm. until maybe 30 years after the war was over that these photographs mm -hmm. surfaced. But at that very moment, I did not move. I stayed where I was separated from her because I was absolutely stunned that she was taken alone into the crowd and my mother and children had already passed and lots of others were moving in that direction. And I, it was obvious to me that she will not catch up to them. Mm -hmm. And I, I somehow felt that I, I just can't leave like this. What will happen to her? Mm -hmm and that she will be alone in this crowd. And, and even as this is happening, we're still trying to find some um, logical or civilized explanation to what's going on here. So if women and children are taken, are separated, and young adults are separated, it means that it's some kind of a labor camp. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, families will be reunited periodically. Why should we not think that that? Mm -hmm. And that even with that thinking in my head, I felt that uh, how is this little sister of mine going to 
ever even get to the point of being reunited. Nobody asked her name or anyone's name. Nobody asked identification or something was terribly wrong suddenly. The, the civilized perception isn't working. And so I stood there for an instant until someone told me to move on in the direction. And I ran, trying to catch up with my sister Serena, who was already up the road. I was yelling for her, and she finally heard me and turned around and said to me, why didn't you go with mom? She also looked at it the way that normal people would look. You're a child, you should be right. with mom, not with the young adults. So that was our, my very, very traumatic arrival to Auschwitz, where suddenly the entire family was torn apart. Then what happened to you and Serena? Well, Serena and I, with many young adults, were then taken to a processing place, a bathhouse, where everyone's hair was shaved and body hair was shaved very cruelly and very, very disrespectfully were disinfected, our clothes was taken away, this uh, uniform dress, uh, shoes were taken away, and, and we were uh, treated with a great deal of contempt and disrespect. And when we came out of there, I, there was a picture, I don't know if it showed up here, where um, everybody came out looking alike with the hair gone, sisters, mothers didn't recognize each other. And uh, then we were taken into barracks, into what was then Auschwitz-Birkenau. We still didn't know where we were. Mm -hmm. And we asked the uh, others who had come before us, the first question we asked, when is the reunification, when is the meeting with the families? When will I see my mom? When, when we will see, see when will we get together? Yeah. We, we absolutely felt that is going to happen sometime. Mm -hmm. And they were pointing to a, a chimney visible in the distance with smoke and even flames coming from it. And they just said, look at that, that's where your families are. And we said to each other and we thought, what is going on here that you talk like that? What, what kind of people are you? Why are you saying these things to us? Uh, we, it didn't penetrate. We, it was something bizarre. Incomprehensible. Incomprehensible. But soon, uh, things became clearer. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the work that you were forced to do since you were selected for labor. What, what was the work that you were made to do? Yes, yeah, so we, for about three weeks, we really did nothing, but we were rather locked into these barracks and in, in these kind of shelves where we were supposed to stay, except when permission given to get off, to get out to the bathroom or for other, some other reason. But uh, if, after three weeks, we were uh, tattooed mm -hmm. and uh, counted off and told that you will now be marched off to work in another section of the camp. Uh, rumors had it that uh, that's a place that might be okay. Uh, you know, people were rumor, rumors. Should you line up? Should you try to get out of it? Is this the end of your life or something a little better? At any rate, we were, we were marched in, to this place where we discovered that all the belongings of the people who came in the trains were brought to this place. And all the belongings that came out of the gas chambers after people were killed, their belongings were brought to this place. It was a storage area for all the stuff that came into Auschwitz-Birkenau by hundreds of trains. Clothing, Clothing shoes. All the belongings, depending yeah. on how off, how uh, long these people were out of their home or ha ha. there was everything mm -hmm. there was clothing there were uh, pots and pans suitcases there were uh, toothbrushes eyeglasses shoes baby carriages 
some food products, mm -hmm. violins, you name it. Wh whatever people thought, books, whatever mm -hmm. they brought would, with them that was allowed or they thought would be helpful to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was piled, dumped outside from the trains by trucks that went back and forth hauling the stuff from the train from the platform. It was dumped outside alongside the barracks and the stuff accumulated as high as the roof of the barrack. You could literally barely see the roof from the piles of shoes and clothing and, and belongings. And we were assigned to get this stuff inside the barracks out of the weather. Mm -hmm. And once uh, inside, eventually, they were sorted out by categories of types and things, and the uh, stuff was sent to Germany for use by the German people. But while we were working there day and night, two shifts, nights and day, um, the stuff kept coming from the trains, and we could never make a dent in the pile. It was just constantly replenished because from Hungary, the Jews were deported from Hungary within six weeks after Germany occupied Hungary. So in six weeks, they deported over 400,000 people into Auschwitz. In six weeks? In six weeks. Mm -hmm. and, that, and something like 140 trains, long trains, mm -hmm. arrived in Auschwitz with people and the stuff that they did bring. And, and Irene, you where you were forced to do the sorting of all the, 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 the belongings that had been taken, from that place you could see the incoming trains and I think you described it as you had a window on the Holocaust uh, right there. Unfortunately, you know, we, we worked adjacent to one of the gas chambers uh, with crematorium number four mm -hmm. and we were divided from that building by a, a, one electrified fence. And we would see what was going on on the premises on the other side. We would see um, people going in huge columns of men and women and children going in there and disappearing in the gate. And we would see um, burning of bodies in pits outside on the premises because the uh, crematoriums couldn't keep up with the, with the pace of, the, of mm -hmm. the dead and so they burned bodies outside. We saw that. We saw columns of women and children coming at night from the trains and seeing the fire clearly and they would scream and, pl and, and pray and cry and soon it would be silence. And then I would, we would hear, I would hear uh, the hissing of the train on the platform arriving was close enough. And uh, hissing of a steam engine and all that, and the noise of the crowd, you know. And in, in a matter of a half hour or so, we would see the columns of women and children and elderly mm -hmm. uh, approaching in front of our, our window. When you arrived at Auschwitz, as you told us, your father was selected for work. What happened to your father? Well, my father and the other men, when they were separated from the rest of us on, uh, upon arrival, they were then, the, the way it was done, they were then reselected because from among them they had to pull out the older men and younger boys, and so they too were killed. Mm -hmm. And my father, apparently, we found out later, much later, when we were working in this area next to the uh, fence, that he was actually selected to work in the uh, uh, gas chambers, in that section where our own men, our own people, our own fathers and sons were made to pull out the dead from from the gas chambers mm -hmm. and were made to help with the burning of the bodies. Mm -hmm. And he was one of those who was forced to work there. Mm -hmm. 
he was shot, uh, we were told, by someone who was able to give us that information. He was shot soon after because he wasn't able to do that kind of work. My 16-year-old brother, no one knows what happened to him. We don't know whether he was with my father. This is Moshe. Um, yes. To this day, you don't to know. This, though, he, there was never anyone who could give us any information from survivors that we would question, did mm -hmm. you know, did you ever meet anybody mm -hmm. like that? Mm -hmm. He disappeared. Uh, to this day, we have no idea. My father, who, who worked in this place, um, since we were next door and saw these men outdoors frequently, uh, sometimes they would throw over a note. And this is how we found out that my father had been there. Someone threw over a note. But these men are all men who, in the most incredibly diabolical cruelty that they could do this to, are men who had to do this to their families. Is indescribable. Mm -hmm. And my, for many, many years, I could never, I, could, I would tell about how my parent, how my mother and children were killed, what happened to some of them. I could never talk about how my father died mm -hmm. because to imagine that this gentle person, head of a loving family, would be subjected to such a such a thing, this is not anything that happens on on this earth. Right. We'd like to believe it would have never happened. Yes. Irene, soon after you came to Auschwitz, you in, you did um, encounter your two aunts, Rose and Peary, and they would become absolutely essential to your survival and that of Serena's um, from there. Tell us about Yes, it that. was quite by accident that they came a day or two before us and uh, the Hungarian Jews arriving to sort of a general area of Auschwitz-Birkenau. So we ran into them by accident, by sheer luck, really. And they did take us under their wings, and, and they made sure that we ended up in the barrack in which they were. Mm -hmm. They exchanged some other uh, people, two people from this barrack to that, because the count of individuals had to be so had to precise. Be, yes, but they prevailed on, you know, through conversations. Mm -hmm. People were kind enough to let us come and to move mm -hmm. to another barrack. At this point, the, the, they, it just the, the, the numbers had to match, you're right. right. Names right. were never taken anyway, so. Just the numbers. Just the numbers, so. So my, my aunt Rose and Pearl, they, I never would have survived. Mm -hmm. I am sure of it because from the moment I arrived there, I was terrified. I was absolutely mm -hmm. in a panic of terror because I, I saw that, um, that we were just uh, disposable numbers. Right. And uh, they really did both protected me and my sister because even though what, what the guards did in this place was um, treat us as subhuman people, no, not like people. We were not uh, human beings. And that feeling of being uh, treated as a subhuman by another human being is extremely frightening because you have no recourse, you have no protection if another human being thinks of you as less than a human being and can do anything. He is the law, he's God. It's terribly frightening. And being young, I was in constant danger of being reselected right. because I was only 13. And so to the only people that I was still a, a, a human being was to my two aunts and to my sister. I was their sister's child. I wasn't a subhuman. I clung to them desperately. And they would do all they could to make you look older, uh, to, to protect you from being selected again. Yes, they did. In, in the lineup of counting every morning, which was a routine, you know, no one escaped from a place like that, but they counted you 
5 a.m. in the morning, we were thrown out into the cold, line up five in a row, and and the jet, a delegation of Nazis and uh, would would come around nine, ten o'clock. Finally, all dressed up in coats and warm boots, and they would look down the line and count the fives, but. This was an, a great opportunity for them to reselect the ones they missed, like children, or people who were not looking good enough for work. And all they did is come here, and that was the end of you. That was the end of it. <laughs> and so my two ends would position me on a hill a little, on a stone a little, or, you know, I was never the first one, I was never the last one. I was sort of put in, in a sandwiched place. Sandwiched in the middle. Uh, sandwiched. Yeah. But every morning was, was a, a dangerous time for me. And Irene, you would continue living under these horrifying circumstances and conditions for eight months until, I believe, until January of 1945, when as the Soviets uh, were advancing, the Nazis um, evacuated Auschwitz, and you were forced then to go on a death yes, march. Yes, yes. So we arrived there in May, and in, in, this, in January, uh, the Russian front, the Russian army, was approaching Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And instead of allowing the remainder of the prisoners in Auschwitz to be liberated, the Germans had another uh, diabolical idea to empty the, empty the camp and force the prisoners on a death march deeper away from the front and into Germany. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what the rationale was there except that it had one result, it diminished our number by huge, in, in a very big way, because it was winter time, and we were marched out on the highway in the snow and, and the outdoors. With without, no food. No food, no water, no facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, if you sat down or hung, hung you know, uh, onto someone, you were shot. There was, uh, the road was littered with dead people. And occasionally, deep in, into Germany, they would stop a, a bunch of us in, if they, uh, in, a, and put us into an, another camp along the way, which was already crowded. Again, there was not even enough uh, time to, or space to be indoors in a barrack. We'd be outside, sleeping outside. We ended up fr from Auschwitz all the way near Hamburg, by the time... Deep in Germany. Deep, deep in Germany, with huge diminished numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, people died uh, uh, along the way. And then there was five more months of the war before 1945, May, before the same Russian army reached us near Hamburg. Mm -hmm. So in those five months, the suffering was indescribable because even the German system such as it was broke down by then because they were retreating mm -hmm. and my aunt Pearl we were infested with lice at this point and starving and she came down with typhus and uh, they took her away in a truck to a place where they had a killing facility very soon after that my sister who was skin and bones by now she was picked out of a line to be to be killed, and my Aunt Rose was desperately ill with a high fever lying on the floor. She was the next one that wasn't going to make it, and when they picked out my sister, I realized that I would be left alone, mm -hmm. and that terror that was always with me suddenly became unbearable, and so I said, I'm her sister, and so they said, well, you can go too. And you knew what that meant. I knew exactly where right. they were taking her. And I clung to her. She said, you can go too. And so they locked us in a room with other women who were in very bad shape, young women. And we were waiting for the truck to come. And at the end of the day, we were still locked in there. And it seemed that the truck wasn't coming. It turned out that because of the approaching Russian front and the chaos on the road, the truck didn't arrive that day. And somebody pushed the door, opened, and we just walked out of the, that locked room. We had a chance to survive another day. Well, but had the truck come, 
I probably wouldn't be here today. What, what was that like to walk out? I mean, and you, you didn't know what you were walking out to. What was that like? No, we were, we didn't know. Were the Germans really gone? You didn't know? They, uh, at this point, when we got back in, out of this room, we were not yet free. Mm -hmm. We just went back to, to the room, the barrack where the we barrack. came from. Mm -hmm. And there my Aunt Rose was lying on the floor, flushed with fever. Mm -hmm. And the, the interesting thing did happen that the other women sitting around on the floor there, when we came in, they said, the children are back, the children are back. And it's the first time ever referred to us as children because no one ever dared that to call us. That would have been a death us. sentence. Right. right. But they were, apparently, the, the women were sort of sad and mourning our, us. They, we, you know, they thought they'll never see us again. And, and here you were back. And we, we were back. But it wasn't over at that point. There were mm -hmm. some months to go until mm -hmm. uh, the liberation Tell came. us about your liberation. It wasn't a joyous affair because we were sick and far from home, and we knew that we had lost our families, mm -hmm. hoping that someone might, might have returned, like my brother or some young adult. But we were um, not taken care of by the liberating soldiers in this particular place. Mm -hmm. the, they were Russian soldiers. They had other reasons for leaving, but they just looked and left, looked at us and left. And we were did, did, they say, did anybody say you're free to go? Did no, you, no. no. Well, actually, our first um, sign of liberation was that the guard tower was empty mm -hmm. for the first time. And people didn't move because mm -hmm. what if they're still around? What if they're coming back? We heard war noises, right. shooting and so on. But, but nobody left. A few hours later, some of the braver women, they went and tried the gate, the big gate, and, and it was open. And still people didn't want to leave because they felt that the Nazis, the soldiers are down the road or whatever. So slowly, slowly, we, um, those who could walk, would walked into the nearest town and looked around and moved into some empty houses. And there was no help and there was no transportation. And what did you do from there? From there, we... Um, uh, I literally walked on the highway, hitchhiked occasionally, if somebody, a wagon mostly. Mm -hmm. um, transportation in Germany was uh, destroyed. There were no trains, buses, nothing moved. And we just went from town to town. Trying to make your way back home? Just, you know, rumors had it, go this way. There would be some uh, a gathering place where they feed, feed you. Mm -hmm. There were people on the move refugees, thousands, dis thousands. thousands of people on the move, displaced people trying to head home. It took us a very long time until we stopped with the, the sick among us. We'd, in every town there was a hospital, we put the sick among us in a hospital, not to be cured or anything, just to rest for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. We'd then take them out, sick as they were, move on. We lost many along the way. Eventually we made our way to Prague. It was a long journey, and we finally were in Prague, where we uh, began to um, seriously inquire about if anyone survived through wor word of mouth. There was no communication. Did anyone survive besides you and Serena and your aunt? Some, the most important person who survived, who finally took charge of us, was one who, a young man, uh, my mother's brother, uh, uh, my uncle Joe, who, uh, when things got bad, the Hungarians occupied us way back, he decided to try to escape. Mm -hmm. He got out, a single man, a young man alone, and he made his way f to Palestine, which was then a place that Jews tried to reach young adults who could. He made his way, he had his own tragic <laughs> experiences. He was put in jail, he was sent back part of the way, he, but he made it. And after the war, during the war, he, uh, not, uh, during the war, he volunteered as a, uh, as a soldier in the Czechoslovak army. And 
many of these young men enlisted to come back to liberate Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we met, he came so back, he was back as, as a soldier. soldier. He was okay. back in Prague as a soldier in a British uniform, mm -hmm. but a, as a Czech soldier mm -hmm. and with a huge number of soldiers. Mm -hmm. And one of these soldiers we asked in the street, you know, where do you come from? They came from Palestine and my Aunt Rose, who was still with us, this was her brother. And so she found out that he was also nearby, mm -hmm. stationed nearby, and we communicated with him. And he didn't know that any of his family was alive. There was years of no communication, and we didn't know that he was alive. And he came and took charge of this bundle, a few, a few survivors, two grandchildren, and one of his sisters. Later we found that a, f a young brother, an additional young brother, single adults had a better chance to survive. The, the sisters who had, were married and had children, they were killed with the children. Your sister Serena is uh, 92 now, am I right? And she's living uh, with her husband in well, New she's, Jersey. Yeah, she's almost 90 actually, almost but 90. yes, but she's fine. Her husband is also a survivor. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're uh, still okay, living uh, independently. And uh, they they have children and grandchildren. Yes, Irene, I I, th I think our audience knows that we could have spent the entire afternoon and only just really still touch the surface of what Irene could share with us. But um, and we haven't had an opportunity for you to ask questions, so. We're going to close the program in just a few minutes. Irene, you're willing to stay behind? Mm -hmm. So Irene will stay up here when she's done uh, on the stage. So if you have a question you would like to ask her, and we, we invite you to do that, please come up on the stage, ask Irene a question, or just just take have your photo taken with her, just say hi to her, whatever you want to do. You're welcome to do that. It's our tradition at first person that our first person has the last word. Um, so I'm going to turn back to Irene to close the program. <laughs> Um, I want to thank all of you for being with us, remind you that we'll have first person programs each Wednesday and Thursday until the middle of August. And of course, Irene, I just, I, I know how difficult this is for you. Thank you for being willing to share what, what, what for us is incomprehensible. Thank you for being a, such a brave, brave witness.